Did you do the homework? Did you read the part from NCRT that I asked you to do? The, unfortunately, I forgot about it. Sir. I just please from one hour. I mean, not one hour, like two hours ago, and I didn't have time. Forgot about it. Okay. Um, in this, in in this case, I can just only appreciate your honesty, but it's okay. You should read. Okay, you have to read this part. It's not yeah. something very very different or um, difficult that you won't be able to understand. So section seven point eight is like it's put like a brief story of like what I wanted to tell you was evolution, how it happened, what are the proofs. Now this part just tells you what what happened. Actually, just a recap of life starting from a single cell to <clears throat> multicellular plants and animals okay so it talks about basically the plant and animal evolution and i also ask you to read the mechanic there's a small section called mechanism of evolution where they talk about mutations and saltation any doubts in that matthew did you read matthew fatima Nabia? Not the whole thing sir but then um, actually i missed the latter part of uh, yesterday's class because so i had some internet connection issues by the end i i think i had the last like five ten minutes so I did not know okay. about this. Okay, okay, but okay. Anyways, it's fine, it's fine. Don't worry. Okay, Kulsum has also joined. So let's begin. Good evening, Kulsum. Any doubts before we begin? Anything that you want to ask? Based on the reading? <clears throat> no, okay. So let's start with a quick summary. So just the last class summary, who would like to summarize? Fatima is asking something in words, how does evil of horses happen? You, you could have written a one sentence, Fatima, right? Oh? Uh, so you were starting, so I didn't want to disturb you after starting, ah. so I just wrote the first word. Okay, okay. Okay, I understand. So, you know, there is, a, there is a behavior in messaging as well. And it reminds me of, a, you know, pe people just write all sorts of very, very different articles and research papers. One of which was, how do we, how can we figure out something from the way people text, you know? Some people write very long, long things. The other people are the word people, like, hmm, yes, what, okay. And even if it is, they write long sentences, they write it in, they fragment it into words, mostly either single or couplets, not more than that. So that just reminded me of that. Okay, here Fatima used it for urgency too. You, know, you can just feel that she just wanted to wait. You know, wait is that word which you just say, then you got the audience, right? Wait, and then you can just take your time and say whatever yeah. you want. Cool, so you want to know something about the evolution of horse, right? Okay, I'll, I'll take it towards the end. So it's, uh, it's you, you should know it because it's very interesting uh, how horses developed hoofs. So horses evolution is studied for their hoofs or all the hoofed mammal, you know what are hoofs? So if you look at the horse feet, it just, it will have a division in the center. And this is how the horse feet is like when it walks, there's taka 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 sound so these are just hoops two blocks of keratinized it's, it's keratin basically it's the nail like we have the nail they have the hoops so how did this evolve because uh, if you go to the ancestors of mammals and reptiles they have digits like you can actually see that their limbs have digits finger like fingers you can say just fing their fingers only not horses and also you know um, cows buffaloes so for this it's interesting so we'll we'll uh, is it okay if i take it towards the end fatima yes sir, no problem okay so i'm just writing it here it will remind me okay a quick summary so uh, how about you fatima just a quick summary it was Basically, some important things that we did in the last class. 
just can you summarize it in five minutes yeah so yep. we started with biological evolution we wrote a definition of biological evolution which says the evolution by natural selection happens to all living systems and it must have started with the earliest cellular form of life where differences in metabolic capabilities was there uh, then we did a question which was uh, do you think simpler organisms evolve faster mm. or slower? Yeah. Uh, and justify your answer. So the answer is that simpler organisms do evolve faster because their life, life cycle or lifespan is uh, smaller. So they can adapt faster through genetic inheritance. Yeah. They, they can actually in, uh, do this genetic inheritance thing faster. Like every generation comes up very quick. So if it needs, let's say, 10,000 generations to make, a, to make a major change in the species, that can happen very fast, right? Because 1,000 generations can reach very fast. So simple, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. and then we wrote the summary of um, this biological evolution, which was that the two pillars of Darwinian theory of evolution, which is natural selection and branching um, descent. Mm. Natural selection, we already discussed. Branching descent is basically from one organism, like many other organisms are coming. And then we discussed the uh, Lam Lamarckian the theory, which uh, stated that evolution is driven by use or disuse of organs at will. We discussed an example of gira giraffes, in which Lamarck said that the giraffes had a shorter neck before, and because they tried to eat the leaves on top of the plant, uh, on top of the plant because they are more nutritious, their neck evolved. But then this theory was disproven by Darwin because, um, because, oh yeah, because uh, yeah. it cannot be, um, it cannot be inherited because only genetical. Uh, genetic genetical variation can be inherited uh inherited so from that we concluded that evolution is driven by mutations yes right <clears throat> great and uh, so today i'll take from here and today we'll begin with hardy Weinberg principle i'm not sure if you have heard of it like if this part has been done in your school or not if anyone who's heard of hardy Weinberg principle before yeah yeah what have you heard of it i remember the equation p plus q is equal to one i guess and yeah, p which makes, are the alleles which makes no it. sense yeah right yeah you're right you're right you're good yes complete if you just remember the equation it's as bad as remembering nothing so See, when you study, don't just study for remembering the bottom line, right? Because that can just take you as far as getting some good marks in exam. Believe me, um, all of you here in the class, I find all of you way more smarter and intelligent than I was when I was your age, okay? And I did fairly good in, in science and in life in general, in research. So I believe if I can do it, any one of you, anyone can do it. All what, all what is required is that, you know, by, by just, I did not have that much time to just keep studying for, you know, for, for, mark, like for marks. But ironically, I used to get good marks. I used to be the top of the class. I don't know how. I think my other... It's because my other classmates really wanted me to, you know, top. So I used to just feel that they were they were they were just letting me. Okay, you go and go and do that. But to tell you, when I entered college, I realized that just studying for the bottom line or for the definitions or remembering things won't take you very far. You know, as a especially as for a doctor. You need to learn a lot of things, a lot of things. And also you have to memorize a lot of things. If you are already going to just keep your brain shut 
and remember things it's not going to help you as a doctor as a researcher even less you need to understand so hardy winberg principle if someone asks you if you have studied it if your teachers are not teaching you in a way where you feel like hardy winberg you know you are the one who realized oh it makes sense and if i was in in their shoes way back 200 years ago i would have said the same thing or i would have reached at the same thing because it makes sense right does it make sense to you that earth is spherical and not flat or or you just remember it because because you have never been to space right you have never seen earth from the outside and to realize oh it's actually sphere so you are on the earth you see some pictures for that matter you can also go and look at flat earth picture and their th theories but does it make sense to you that earth is actually a sphere a ball and not a flat disk yes or no am i audible am i audible people yes Anyone? sir yeah yeah so does it make sense to you why does it make sense to you just because you have studied it in a textbook is it the bottom line you remember there must be many other things it should be your belief by now right you just even if you don't remember who was the first person who said that you know that it's a truth that uh, i actually believe in because i have reasons to believe in it yes sir. it's not just a fact i studied in books right there are many things many uh, um, uh, proofs which you experience in your day to day life or you know is happening you can give it to a person in debate similarly so hardy winberg principle is a very very uh, logical principle that that tells you about the whole gene pool of the system how this how the genes and the alleles and their combinations actually work okay so what what this principle says is that i told you about variations happen in sexual reproduction yes or no correct yes sir so there will be many many genes uh um, and so there are many different genes but for each gene there will be different alleles as well yes or no yeah now these yeah. alleles how different can they be and how many different variations are possible for these alleles to exist in every human or in any given population okay so their frequency if you do not if you do not do major changes or alterations to the whole population their frequency mathematically should remain the same through generations by saying that their frequency remains the same i am not saying that there is no variation there is variation but that variation in a broader context remains the the frequency of that variation remains the same now what i am so this is a mathematical thing might be this is the definition that you must have uh, remembered as a bottom line but what it means what it means is that have have any one of you ever seen a person who's not related to you but you see that person and you see that oh this person looks like my xyz relative or at least you know has a similar kind of eyes or the similar kind of nose has it happened to you yes i said for every person there's a clone yes yeah, said for every person there's a clone and um, more and more it's getting you know <clears throat> there's also a saying you know when i was in this part of the world um, uh, our elders used to say that there are seven people in the world with the same face kind of thing i don't know i don't know where the statistics came from but yeah but if not seven you will find that some people have the same kind of eyes or some people have the same nose shape some people have the same ear same uh, or if you see um, these uh, people who are doubles of the of the stars star look like have you have you seen any star look like there are many you yes, go sir. on internet and you search star look like you know matt damon or tom cruise or shahrukh khan you will find many and they vary in extent some will look so good just exactly like you know one particular character of shahrukh khan in a goggles you know why in goggles if you remove the goggle their eyes will be different but rest of the facial features are same so they put a goggle on glasses on to just look like shahrukh you understand what i'm trying to say 
so yes yeah so how whatever is the number different numbers of alleles and different number of variations for every character it actually the gene pool the overall gene pool of every species is fixed there can be x number of different kind of nose shapes that is possible and that's a finite number in humans you cannot have all sorts of nose you know? like nose is uh, what do you say it's governed by its uh, its its function comes from its structure have you heard in biology structure brings function and then function leads to structure for example flippers of whale and um, wings of the bat so they come from similar structures but their functions are different so the structure slightly differs overall yes or no yes sir. make sense yep so uh, write down what this says that hardy winburg principle states that the allele frequency that the allele frequencies in any given population in any given population is stable and constant is stable and constant from generation to generation from generation to generation okay this also means in other words you can just write that the total gene pool the total gene pool and gene pool means all the alleles sorry all the genes and all their alleles combined for every species in a population okay so its total gene pool means genes plus alleles all the alleles the total gene pool for a population for a population remains a constant or is a constant unless and until you tweak the population or you make the population go through some some um, what do you say some processes that alter hardy winburg principle okay we'll study what alters hardy winburg principle as well so this thing is this principle is also known as the principle of genetic equilibrium and you know what does equilibrium means right have you heard of equilibrium in chemistry yes, you must sir. have yes yeah, sir what? yes arpit is here with hello arpit how are you good evening sir good evening how are you sir i am well sir how are you i am good i am good so yes for what is equilibrium you said a big yes so i am guessing that you know it sir when the net force on an object is zero so it is one like yes uh, that's from physics point of view anything like physics uh, chemistry biology equilibrium simply means when um there's no change right there's no change if it's force then uh, the delta the change is zero but does that mean like if uh, if you say that on a body there is a push of 10 newtons and a pull of 10 newtons in opposite direction then it is in equilibrium right it will not move anywhere yes or no yes correct do you understand yes sir yes sir yeah. yes sir but that's again given some conditions that on both the sides the friction is fine you know and all these sorts of things you apply but often equilibrium is there where there is no net change in in chemistry you must have studied it in terms of movement of ions through diffusion or through any transport when the inside inwards flow of anything is equal to the outward flow of the same thing then it it is in it rests in equilibrium 
So equilibrium means no delta, no net change, but does it also mean that nothing is moving? No, not necessarily, right? So if you see, there is force. If you see there are ions moving from one side to the other and equal ions are moving from the other side to the out, like from the inside to the other. So the movement is there, but it's equal. So it gets canceled out kind of. Similarly, in genetic equilibrium, it's not like there is no changes, no variations, alleles are not different. But overall, the population remains in genetic equilibrium. Okay. That's why you are just able to, you know, find in two different corners of the world. These are just mathematical permutation combination. Let's say for eyes, there are how many different kinds of eyes do you think are possible? Let's say, let's say 50. You know, I'm just taking a guess. So let's say 50 different colors of eyes or you know, shapes of eyes, let's say 100 are possible. But we are 7 billion people, right? So don't you think that many people, regardless of whether they come from the same generation, will have similar kind of changes in their genes and uh, so many people will have blue eyes. It's not like all the blue-eyed people came from one family, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> so this is known as genetic equilibrium. And whenever we say something is in equilibrium, so what do we mean? Can I say that the sum total of all, if I, if I, if I sum all the allelic frequencies for any given character, okay, sum total of all allelic frequencies will be one, right? That's why it, that's what it means by staying in equilibrium, right? Can I say this mathematically? You understand? If no, let's take an example. Um, so, okay, let's come to the formula. Let me let me tell you through that only. So, who knew the formula, Fatima? What was the formula, Fatima? You remember? P plus Q is equal to one. P plus Q is equal to one. Was that the formula? Yeah. Then it it what? Which means. If P is, let's say, uh, chances of P is 50%, then you're saying the chances of Q will also be 50%, correct? If it's 25, then it has to be 75. Or oh, if you are saying one, so if it is 0 0.25, it has to be 0 0.75. This is what you mean, right? Yes, sir. But what about heterozygous conditions then? This formula doesn't, it talks about heterozygous conditions. So what is P and Q here? Do you understand P and Q? P plus Q is equal to one. What is P and Q here? Frequency of alleles. So P is frequency of which allele? And Q is frequency of which allele? Why there was only two P and Q? It's an example for one gene. But one gene, like one gene can have more than one allele, sir, right? I told you that for, um, if you take it as an example for one gene, I told you that for skin color, there are around six alleles, right? Of six different genes, let's say. And each gene have many alleles. So what about then? So why we only, why we take two? P and Q, when we have to, why are we assuming that P and Q? So these are the questions that will make you understand this equation, whether this, and this equation does not, is not complete. So anyone would like to give me a complete equation first to begin with? Because it's very, it's binary, P and Q. I'm not saying it's, it, it cannot happen. It can happen in a very simple system where there's only two, Lilic interactions, but anyone who would like to give me a better. No one has, so it's, it has not happened. You have not covered this part in your schools, others, Matthew. Yeah, but uh, sir, but we just can't just sum of total of, sum total of all our Lilic frequencies equal to one. So, ah, okay. you have to do so, P plus U plus uh, R like that. 
okay so don't worry about the rest and okay i think that's what the school teachers are very busy or what they they give you shortcuts i assume okay arpit what about you yes sir this, this part has happened can you can you tell me the equation for hardy winberg principle So we didn't did I didn't did this in school. So okay, it's not happened. Okay, let 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 us let us make the equation then. Okay, let let us be Hardy and Winberg, and let us make the equation. Okay, so if we make it, we'll call it. Uh, you know, uh, whoever will help, we can call it Matthew Fatima equation or Sahel Matthew equation or Fatima Arpit equation. Let's do it. <clears throat> let's consider. let's assume let's start with a diploid organism so imagine in a diploid organism there always will be two copies of every gene right yes sir yeah and so two copies means if on chromosome homologous chromosome these are two homologous chromosome on this location there will be one allele and on this location there will be another allele for the same gene yes or no Yes, sir. yes sir yeah so let me say that in a diploid organism there are two alleles capital t and small t familiar right we did it tallness p plant we are taking p plant yes cool so on one of the chromosome the gene is for the height and on one chromosome the allele is capital t and on the other chromosome the allele is small t why we are only taking two because we are taking diploid organisms and diploids are the most standard so this was the question why only p and q why only two because we often talk about diploid organisms there are tetraploid hexaploid and also uh, haploid organisms but let we, we are doing it for diploid the most standard things we study standard things right first so let's say capital t and small t so this is allele 1 and this is allele 2 now what is the frequency of these two alleles in a population not in an organism in an individual but in the whole population of that p what wherever we are growing it okay in that whole population so let a oh, sorry capital p be the frequency of capital this allele 1 which is capital t and small p be the frequency of this allele so we can make a standard equation so it can it it can be applied to every um every gene and allele like this <coughs> so right so is it clear p is the p is representing the frequency of allele 1 which is capital t okay or i should write capital t here only so that it's not confusing and this is the frequency of the allele small t clear till here yes sir now tell me what are all the ways in which these alleles can be present because it's a diploid organism so what are all the ways which are possible capital t small t yes let's start with the simple one capital t capital t small t small t and one will be small t small t simple homozygotes and the third will be small t capital t small t cool small t yes sorry and oh sorry sorry it's here no no but see you are right arpit you are bringing a very important point which i will so you you said capital t uh, sorry small t capital t if i guess right yes sir yes but that can happen cuz yes that can happen you know you know why that can happen because let's say this is the maternal and this is the paternal chromosome when we write the notations it is in genetics we write it always the dominant allele first okay you understand matthew yes, see sir, mathematically yes, biologically this is the same scenario biologically if any parent brings capital t or any parent brings small t it does not matter to biology the capital t will express in the organism do you understand my point yes, everyone sir, we write yes, capital t small t right exactly we will address it as capital t small t but mathematically this is a mathematical 
equation we are going to make all right Ma sense. yeah math mathematically it makes a difference if the small t is coming from the mother or the small t is coming from the father in that case it will become capital t small t is one frequency and small t capital t is another frequency the frequencies will give rise to the same function biologically that's a different thing is it clear yes sir. but if i have to if i ask you to make all the permutation combinations this is also a possibility right the consequences are same does it does it make sense everyone it's like yeah, if I, I just how it can be small to computing. It because in this case there are two chromosomes. On on the mother's chromosome, there was the allele capital T, and on the father's chromosome, there was the allele small t. But in this case, on the mother's chromosome, there was the allele small t, and on the father's chromosome, there was the allele capital T. In this case, both on mother and both on father there was the allele capital t and capital t so whichever way you write it does not matter it's not a different notation in mathematics in, for mathematics in this case also the mother chromosome also had small t and the father chromosome also had small t so homozygotes are simple whichever you write first it will be the same thing mathematically it's like zero or one so zero zero one one but 0, 1 or 1, 0 is different, right? Yes, sir. What comes first? So this is a different code. This is a different code. Here, both the digits are same. You cannot say that for, for 1, 1, I will write 1, 1. See, and this is the different 1, 1 from the 1, 1. Because the identity is same. So the, the identity for capital T is same. Whether it comes before or after makes a different combination. Now, in biology, both these combinations give rise to the same phenotype. That's a different thing. So we always write it capital T, small t. But for mathematics, it's a different combination. You understand? Now, do you understand, Fatima? Yes, sir. So there are three possibilities. One, two, and three. That's, that's why, you know, you have to be interdisciplinary to understand certain concepts, even for biology. And that's why the field of genetics is the... I have seen many people who, who like physics or uh, mathematics or who are mathematicians and physicists and who want to come into biology, you know, they also start liking genetics in the first go. Oh, it makes sense. I can do a lot of things here. Now, I did a lot of things here. So can I, can I remove certain things to keep it tidy? I'm removing all of this, okay, people? Okay, okay. I hope it's clear to all of you, right? Yes. If yes. not clear, please ask, but do not go gentle into the dark night. Strive and strive, struggle and struggle for the light. Okay. Now tell me for this capital T and capital T, P was denoting the frequency of capital T. So what will be the overall frequency of this? 2p. What? Hmm? The frequency will be p into p, right? This is p into another p, right? I said 2p. Sir, I also. You said 2p. Yeah. yeah 2 into 2. p. 2p is 2 into p. Yes. yes, but exactly. But what I'm saying, 2p mathematically is a but p into p, p is not 2p life. exactly 2 into 2 oh sorry sorry there. you understand it's mathematics yes sir yes sir. it's not p plus p frequencies ah, yes, sir. are like ratios you understand this is where we make mistake it's not 2p if you take it as 2p you will end up making the wrong equation altogether 2p means that 1p and 1p with our two different p's added together which makes 2p but p into p is what P square. So the frequency of a homozygous uh, dominant allele in the population is fixed and is represented as P square. Whatever is P, the square of that number will be the constant frequency of that allele in the gene pool without any perturbation. Make sense? Say yes, yes. everyone. Yes, sir. Yeah. This is where you are making the equation, okay? And that's important. I don't know why teachers don't teach us, but this is the real science. Similarly, tell me for small t, small t. Small p square. Small p is the whole square. Eric, we, oh, sorry. My mistake. 
You are correct. Let's take it as Q. Q is not a. Yes. So this is Q square. Okay. Because we wanted different notations, not here. Now, interesting part is tell me for this one. P Q. Mm -hmm. You are correct. P Q. But see, there is some this something you are missing. How many combinations are there? Two P Q. Two P Q the whole square. Yeah. Here, they, here they are not yes here they are not inter multiplying see for this it is p for this is it q for this also it is p and for this also it is q and these are not multiplying in one generation right so these are two different combinations so this will be 2 p q you understand why it will be 2 here yes, yes. so at the level of interaction between two alleles for the same gene they are it's multiplicative p into p or q into q but here these are two combinations so it will be 2 pq it can exist either in this or in this so it has to be added for the population not multiplied for the population you understand everyone yes sir. yes now what was the definition the sum total of all allelic frequencies is equal to one. one. So simply you make a equation which is p square plus q square plus 2pq equal to one. one. And if you pay attention in mathematics, you have studied something like this. If I just plus do some, yeah, if I do some changes, it will become p square plus 2pq plus q square is equal to one. And this looks something similar like a square plus 2ab plus b square is equal to 1. And so what will be the shorter version of this? Does it P look similar? Q. Yes. Sir. Yes. It's p plus q whole square. Make sense, Fatima? Yes, sir. So what you said, p plus q is equal to 1, was not correct. You understand why it was not correct now? Now you all made this formula, so you bet you will not, you will never forget it, right? So this is known as binomial expansion formula. It is the mathematically this is the. You have studied binomial expansion. Uh, uh, yes. Sir. This is the expression for that. So how this is how it can mathematically be written. <clears throat> so you understand what is hardy winburg principle and where did it came from? It was not just someone just thought and gave any equation. You can just understand it. It has a biological significance. Make sense? So if I ask you, if I ask you a question now, in a, uh, let's say, um, this formula is with you. And if I give, write down a question, the frequency, I don't know question. The frequency of a homozygous recessive allele, the frequency for a homozygous recessive allele in case of a flower color, in case of a flower color, where the do where the dominant allele is capital R for red and the recessive allele is small r for white. So this is the information is so I am is zero point one eight for this. This is the only information you have. So the frequency for homozygous recessive allele or pair in a flower color where capital R stands for red and small r stands for white. So for white, it's given. Can you find the frequencies of uh, heterozygotes and homozygote red now? 
So 0.18 means if I translate it in percentage, it is 18%, right? So if I say that 18% of the flowers will be white, now you can tell me what percentage of flowers will be uh, pure red and what percentage of flowers will be either pink if it follows incomplete dominance or uh, heterozygous red if it follows complete dominance. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you now? So what is the question? Find the frequency or? This, these two. Can you find it? Sir, this is the case of incomplete dominance. So, you, yeah, like without even knowing whether what is the case, is it incomplete dominance? You can know about that also. Yeah, that will be the next step, but just figure out how many of them. This is just a hypothetical case, not a case of incomplete or complete dominance. I just made it up right now. Hypothetically, if I tell you that if white is 18%, you can you tell me how many will be red and how many will be uh, heterozygous red and how many will be homozygous red? Both in terms of, tell me percentage only. 0 0.72. 0.72 will be what? For the red. For this, for this one? Yeah. Then what is this one? 0 0.72 plus 0 0.18 becomes one, right? No. Yes. So in the case of percentage, it will be 100 now, 70%. Yeah, so this will be a different percentage. This will be a different percentage and this will be, there will be three percentages. You're only telling me two. Three, there are three terms here, no? A square plus this plus this should become one or hundred percent. I have given you only for B square. You have to so, find me. Um, heterozygous would be 0 0.64 and homozygous would be 0 0.18. Exactly. 64% will be heterozygous and 18% will be homozygous red because 18% were homozygous white. This is what you're trying to say, right? Yes, exactly. And if you see the red total, if it follows complete dominance, the question can go another level. And uh, given that the plant follows incomplete dominance, tell me the colors. This can also be the question. Then you will say 18% will be red, 64% will be pink, and 18% will be white. Given that they follow dominance, uh, the Mendel's law, then 0 0.64 plus 0 0.18. This percent will be red and this percent will be white. So you understood the application of R.D. Winberg. We just need to know one alleles frequency. For the other, you can find it out because it is constant. We could not have been able to done, do it if it was not constant in the gene, gene pool. Make sense? Yes, sir. Everyone, Fatima. Now you people can go back and teach your batchmates, your classmates, you know. Do you know about Hardy Winburg principle? How did it came into existence? What it means? Much more than that. Everyone is clear? Shall I move forward? Any doubts, please ask. Fatima, is it clear? Sir, I understand this. You want me to repeat? This question. Question, okay. So the question is, write down the question in words. Have you written the question in words, everyone? The question in words. Can you read that question for me? What have you written? The frequency of a homozygous recessive allele in case of a flower color where the dominant allele is capital R for red and the recessive allele is small r for white is 0 0.18. Find the frequency yes. of capital R, small r, and capital R, capital R. Yes. So you know that there can be three possibilities, right? Let me solve it for you. So it's given that capital R 
is the dominant allele okay and small r is the recessive allele okay now this gives the red color and this gives the white color responsible for in homozygous conditions so if there is capital r capital r it will be red flower if there is small r small r it will be white flower and because it follows the rule of dominancy the capital r small r will be pink color. again red no following the rule of dominancy i said oh yeah red color right yes, if we see, if the question just to com make it complex the question can say that uh, the species follows incomplete dominance then this will be pink you understand yes sir. now for the question has given you for this the free, uh, frequency of small r so the frequent and uh, uh, now let's say p denotes for this and q denotes for this okay the frequencies now r and r become q square yes padima yes sir this is how we done above right here also for capital t capital t so capital t the frequency is denoted by p for small t the frequency is denoted by q similarly here also for capital r the frequency is p the small r the frequency is q you have assumed it now for small r small r it will be q square for capital r capital r tell me it will be p square p square perfect and for this combination it will be two p q two p q again biologically we know that this is also this is the only thing that we write but we know now the inherent in maths this is also possible right that's why we are taking this two yes sir we'll always take two now the question has already given you q square what is q square 0.18 0.18 and you know that p square plus q square plus 2 pq together becomes 1 1 so if you know about q square so it is x plus 0.18 plus no what do you say Two x y is equal to one. Now, can you figure out for x and y? Yes. You understand because it has to be one. So very simply, it's simple that what it's going to be here. If this is zero point one eight q square, so you know what is q. You have to find q. And similarly, you have to find p. And PQ, you have to just add it. So if only for one condition it's given, like Matthew said, this and this condition will be equal, and then there will be height heterozygotes. Because if you add eighteen plus sixty four plus eighteen, it becomes hundred, right? Yes, sir. Makes sense. If they have given you for the heterozygous condition, mostly in questions they will give you for this two PQ. Then you have to find what is the homozygous and the Oh, sorry the homozygous for dominant and the homozygous for recessive which is again easy right you can already you can find p and q from here and then do the square of it is it clear everyone yes sir yes sir sahel samaira kulsum yes sir no doubts right okay cool so now write down the factors what factors can affect so this is hardy winberg equilibrium and this is what it its biological application means but as i told you we assume many things are constant and not changing when we assume hardy winberg principle hardy winberg equilibrium to be uh, present in a population now we can change that hardy winberg equilibrium now when i say that changing it's not like it will still be one only right the total will always be one it will not be two because it's not it does not make sense the maximum can be 100% right but the frequencies of individual alleles will change so often students get confused when i say that these factors can affect hardy winberg equilibrium they think that the equilibrium itself is getting affected like the threshold is increasing it can never be like now the equilibrium is uh, uh, q square plus p square plus 2pq is equal to 2 no 
but the changes between p and q can happen if there are multiple alleles you understand because if there are let's say three in a in a population where there is a third allele or in in cases where due to mutations the allele changes so a new allele gets introduced okay so this equilibrium can get affected so write down there are five factors that we have studied already that can affect rd winberg equilibrium and this question is asked in the boards or school exams commonly five factors that affect rd winberg equilibrium first is genetic drift okay genetic drift so what is genetic drift anyone knows genetic what is the word drift means to move from a place mm -hmm. but uh, uh okay to move from a place but drift has something else associated drift is to move from somewhere very fast that's drift you are drifting cars on the turns car drift right drifting is where cars don't have to uh, they change the direction without changing the speed they don't slow down to change the direction that's what drift means right none of you have played uh, asphalt or some racing games like yes yeah, sir yes yeah, sir i know that drift but I yes know. so that oh, drift man. is the same drift drift the word drift means the same you drift across water you know you don't slow down but with the same speed you can just change direction that's drifting here also with the with the same population very quickly you are changing the kind of gene combination which is present now genetic drift can be uh, very it, it can be very sudden okay um and it often happens because of any physical or any parameter that can cause very sudden changes in gene population for example let's say there was two kind of beetles living in a jungle okay green beetle and red beetle now you know one way to make that change happen is through natural selection but that is slower let's say green beetles can very easily camouflage in the green leaves so the red one will be pegged right birds will eat the red one so over time like it happened in moth case the green beetle population will keep increasing right yes or no yes yes but the, the it will be otherwise also if if the forest or the place where they live are all maple wood so maple leaves mostly they become red right they are reddish so which beetles will survive better in the red camouflaged condition red and green will decline so that decline depending on what natural stressor is if it is a predation uh, and which can camouflage better can happen over time but let's say they all these beetles are living on the ground okay suddenly there is a elephant stampede elephants just run over the whole place widely thousands of elephants and just by chance the population uh, there is like um, 90% of the population of beetles got wiped out because they got crushed and the 10% that survived they were all green beetles or they were 90% green beetles so do you see a sudden change within few hours the red population just went off and there are just green population majority 90% or 100% it's a hypothetical situation but i'm telling you this can happen right it's a chance event yes. but here but here the genes suddenly changed in one direction now greens one will give keep giving rise to green population more and more and green one will expand without any natural bias or selection or anything happening right so it was sudden that's why it's called genetic drift genetic drift can also happen if without dying you can just um, let's not kill the beetles let's imagine that majority of green beetle migrated to some place so that new region that new location will already have green beetles population overpowering the red ones right so in the new place the genetic equilibrium will be changed now let's say in the older place there were 40% red and 60% green in the new place there will be 90% red and 10% green sorry 90% green and 10% red 
and now when you will find the allele frequency it will be diff different yes or no yes sir makes sense anyone is confused does not make sense please if it makes sense quickly keep saying yes if it does not make sense also quickly keep saying no because you see it's very easy to troubleshoot fatima was struggling with something above and we just did it again and everyone understood it right so this is clear genetic drift write down let me also write make write down what is this <clears throat> Uh, due to my uh, genetic drift is due to sudden shift sudden shift in the gene frequencies sudden shift in the gene frequencies by chance by chance events and these chance events happen in in nature let me tell you one of the chance events if we consider was when suppose yes. you remember yes how can the genes change genes are not changing and what I, what did i say the gene frequency right yeah yeah genes don't change that fast gene frequencies there are three kind of frequencies capital t capital t capital t small t small t small t so this was overpowering in the region then suddenly something happened this got wiped out now this is overpowering in the region so the frequency shifted from here to here right awesome it seemed like biryani lovers and you know, some other nahari lovers were equal all of a sudden 70% of the nahari lovers became biryani lovers so the shift happened quickly because there was an offer 60 70% off on biryani so it was a chance quick event it didn't happen over time due to acquired taste or something other major factor i give this sometimes this absurd analogies but i hope it works do you understand fatima yes sir cool very good so if it's happening just by chance it's called genetic drift one such event uh, in the past was when asteroid hit the planet earth remember that thing we the it, it's it is still accepted partly the reason why dinosaurs disappeared suddenly because we are finding dinosaurs dinosaurs were big amazing big big creatures i cannot just imagine what could kill them off nothing they were on the top of the predatory chain so what happened that we are finding their fossils till some age and when we come to the boundary of uh, cretaceous jurassic and the next phase they are gone we do not find any fossils beyond that so there were no dinosaurs living after that within a couple of million years they are all gone how and why was the question so one of the theories is that sudden shift in the climate happened due to a asteroid collision with the earth and earth got really cold why it got really cold because lots of dust was erupted so some just died by the active encounter or active hit but in other parts of the earth the sun was not visible for many 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 years so much of dust was in the atmosphere and because dinosaurs are reptiles they are cold blooded they could not modulate their body temperature and they were the first to take the hit and be in the cold the reptiles die the first and dinosaurs were big reptiles that was even worse because a small reptile you know um, can still go in the burrow or somewhere find the worm and stay alive but dinosaurs t-rex cannot dig a burrow and go inside to survive so they all died and mammals survived because mammals could modulate their body temperature so now the mammals are ruling the planet that's one theory it's also very acceptable till the another very good theory with proofs come up so the proofs that we have now tells us that this theory might be the most accurate so one. what are the proofs for this theory one of the proofs is that uh, there was a collision and people are trying to find such a if there was such a big collision there there will also be a very big crater somewhere on the planet right 
exactly sir exactly so they it happened that like people scientists have so but that if you find that crater you also have to do the dating to figure out that the crater actually matches with the same time frame where the dinosaurs we stopped finding their fossils onwards so there are craters very big craters uh, and computer simulation models show that the amount of debris released from that collision or the amount of force required also justifies but there are more than one potential candidates now so still but the possibility that there are such kind of collisions that happened at that time is fueling this theory another thing is that uh, you you also start seeing the rise of mammals so if rise of mammals and decline of reptiles come at a point it means that something happened specifically for the cold blooded so that they got eliminated the most and mammals started rising right because that also makes sense that's a that's a logic you uh, do you understand matthew it was not like all reptiles died yes. and then reptiles only started it could also have happened if it was not climate related then if dinosaurs died let's say by some disease because that theory is also being tested if some disease killed all the reptiles then again if the temperature is favorable you know reptiles already had a kick off they are already ruling the planet they could have again just rise right yes, but sir. we saw dinosaurs going down which means reptiles going down and then mammals rising up which means something was there with the climate that only selectively killed the uh, cold blooded and the fact that with collisions so much of dust comes in the atmosphere that sun the intensity of sunlight goes down and there is a long winter you can just see it as a long winter like foggy winters so if there is a long winter for years and decades of course it's going to impact only the uh, reptiles more make sense to you matthew this yes, is all i can tell understood. till now yeah but we are still finding more and more because science does not settle it never settles okay oh, yeah. so i think the the mot motto that never settle should be for science you know not for the one plus company what they took it okay so genetic drift is clear sudden changes by chance that make the shift in the genetic frequencies gene frequencies this is first factor second is genetic flow or gene flow it's also known written in some books as gene migration so gene flow is slow than genetic drift and flow means what does flow means flow means bulk drift can be just a smaller drift right for a sub population of beetles but flow is a bigger term flow is bulkier term flow happens over time so it is slow the whole population of beetles whole population of beetles over time not All just right, by some right. random thing not by stampede but by selection natural selection like it happened in melanized moths case that was a genetic flow it was not a genetic drift didn't happen overnight make sense everyone yes yeah, sir yeah yes so genetic flow can also happen if multiple genetic drifts happen let me explain you like this so because this is an important concept probably we can give one more class to this chapter for human evolution but this is important are you all fine if i give one more class to human evolution yes, if not complete then half class arpit are you fine with that sir actually i am exam so i want to complete. finish today no sir we can do it so because Next i just class, wanted sir. okay is it cool with you that's why i'm asking yeah, yeah i can cut it down but then if i give you one more example it will be better let's say there were two populations okay this is the red one so see my classes have to be democratic so i have to take into consideration everyone's opinion so red and green you can see right so something happened over time and now there are just green population okay with very few red this is genetic drift you understand everyone yes but if this genetic drift which is smaller keeps happening multiple time okay there is another way possible which is few came just the green then few more came another green few more came another green so it's happening at different times but happening from the same bigger population into a sub population 
So multiple genetic drifts can also give rise to a genetic flow over time. Is it clear? Yes. Sir. This is just a possibility. It's very rare. Um, like it happens, but you know, I cannot give you an example, real life example now, but it can happen. And in science, all possibilities have to be studied. So either gene flow can happen over time through selection or multiple genetic drifts over time can also give rise to gene flow. But just write down in front of gene flow. Um, gene flow is when the migration, when the migration of of population when the migration of genetic population <clears throat> happens multiple times in bulk that's called gene flow happens multiple times in bulk so these two can affect the third you already know which can affect um, hardy weinberg equilibrium is mutation. I don't have to teach mutation, right? If any constructive or positive mutation that can help the organism happened over time, for example, antibiotic resistance in bacteria, suppose it came just with a mutation in the next generation. So all of a sudden you will see that the resistant bacteria are growing like blooming everywhere and the non-resistant one will die. Yes? The best yes. example. So mutation can suddenly change the equilibrium. And what else? can change recombination genetic recombination right that's why recombination has a rate but recombination can also give rise to new variations like mutation right genetic recombination through sexual reproduction that also changes genetic equilibrium <clears throat> and natural selection sorry over time due to metabolism, due to predation, anything over time, natural selection. So these are the five factors that affect Hardy-Winberg equilibrium. Cool? Yes, Everyone sir. is clear with this? So now you understand Hardy-Winberg equilibrium and to totally. It, the screen is misbehaving, right? Some things are moving, yes, something is not moving for me. How is it for you? I don't know. So it's like mm -hmm. stuck in the screen, basically. Mm, yeah, just one moment. Let me see what's happening. It sometimes happens when I rewrite too much in one notebook. I should stop doing that. Okay. Is the screen still stuck for you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, is it fine now? Yes. Yes. yes sir. Yeah, it's fine for me. Okay, so if this is clear, sometimes the next thing which I would like to take today is founder effect. This can be asked in your exam. What is a founder effect? Founder effect is simply due to any of these factor. Sometimes the change is so large, like I said, that let's say due to mutation, all of a sudden, there is a new different species of that organism that comes up quickly. For example, antibiotic resistant varieties, strains of bacteria, or a new bacteria altogether. So it's very easy to happen in simple organisms because they evolve faster. But it also can happen with multicellular complex organisms over time through genetic drift, flow, mutation, or natural selection, or recombination. So founder effect is, write down, Sometimes, if the change in allele frequency, sometimes if the change in allele frequencies is so different, is so different, that that the new population becomes a new species altogether 
that the new population becomes a new species altogether, then it is known as, sorry, then, then the originally drifted population, then the originally diff, uh, diff, drifted population is called the founder population. Because they are founding, they are the founding members of a new species. You understand everyone? It's simple, right? 10 people started a company, then three of them just left the company quickly to start a new company. So they became the founder of the new one. They were so different in ideas, they started a new one. Simple, right? So the originally drifted population becomes founders and this effect is called founder effect for the new species. And the process of forming you can also write this, if, uh, the process of forming new species is called speciation. Speciation. Okay. Are both the things clear to you, everyone? Yes. Sir. Yeah. Now I gave you homework to go and read the brief account the summary of evolution for plants and animals uh, which many of you have not done so i am still continuing that homework you have to still do it and read uh, all of you have ncrt right now uh, yes. yes sir please open your ncrt and come to and tell me the page number i'll try to uh, there's i think around the section, the 7.8 section, there are figures that tells you about the evolution, a sketch, a flow chart of evolution of plants and animals. I just want to tell you certain things. You can only come to plant also, not a problem. Can you tell me which page the figure is on? 138. 138, yes. Everyone come to 138. Can you see a figure that tells you about plant evolution? Yes, yes. sir. Okay, now uh, can you look, I'm also opening the figure, yes, yes. Can you see that there are lots of branches going from one to the other? Yeah, which I didn't understand. Yes, so this part, uh, let me, let me take an example, which one is better in branching? Okay, let's go to animals. Animals is better in branching. Even plants are also telling some different things, but let's go to animals. I'll explain animals to you. You'll go back and look at the plant, okay? Plant part. So the plant part is more confusing. Can you explain that one? Okay, cool. I'll explain the plant part, I thought. Let me pull out that figure. Biology. What was the page? What did you say? 138. 138. Evolution. Yes, 138. Got it. I'm sorry, people, just five more seconds. Can you see it? Figure? Yes, sir. Let me make it a little big so it, yes. Is it visible now, everyone? So the same thing you have to go and do for animals, okay? And then we'll finish it. So here on the y-axis, here, you see that these are the, this is the evolutionary time period. Before studying any graph, just try to see how to read it. So evolutionary time period, okay? Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. 
the primitive, the middle, and quite like quite um, recent. Okay. Now here you see it all starts for plants with chlorophyte ancestors. Chlorophyte ancestors was very simple single cells that had chlorophyll. They got chlorophyll in them, so they can do photosynthesis. The first photosynthesizing organisms, which were ancestors of plants. Is it clear? Then you see from here onwards, there is a linear progression for some time and not actually linear because you can see these two branches evolving parallelly. Can you see one from here and one from here? Yes, sir. And where is this first branch going? All the way. So it was very, very, and the thickness of the node in this case tells you about the um, how prevalent these plants were during that period. So you see the chlorophyte ancestors, and if you if you want to know in, in, in terms of um, time scale, the chlorophyte ancestors somewhere evolved um, around before, before animals came. So it's very, very early, around 500 million years ago. And from the chlorophyte ancestors, there come a branch which started becoming more prevalent in the Carboniferous period. This is the period where mostly most of the life just expanded. That's why we call it Carboniferous because it just added a lot of carbon to the ecosystem. All the life is carbon-based, you know that? We are all carbon-based. We are all yes. carbon basically. Because, and how can we just um, prove it? Take any living system and burn it, okay? So in cultures where the dead bodies are burned, when you, what do you see after the burn? Ash. Ashes, right? It's not, it, it, it's not just the ashes which are coming from the wood because wood is used. If you just burn a dead body without any wood, still there'll be a lot of carbon left, the black carbon left. So we are all carbon-based. So Carboniferous, in Carboniferous uh, time, life expanded majorly. So this branch expanded and it's still, today it is prevalent and we call them bryophytes. So in class 11th, in your chapter two or three, I think you said about plant evolution, right? All the different divisions of plant under plant kingdom, right? There you have studied gymnosperms, angiosperms, bryophytes, pteridophytes. Remember? Yes, sir. Yes. So bryophytes are the most primitive of the plants that evolved right after the chlorophyte ancestors and diverged laterally into a branch. Then came the tracheophyte ancestors. Tracheophyte means they started having some kind of um, transport channels for the first time. Then rhinia type and xylophyton. Most of the plants that are today on the earth comes from this branch, the xylophyton ancestors. Whether it is an angiosperm, so xylophytons, one group became pro-gymnosperms. Gymno means naked seed. Angiosperms means coated seed. So coated seed means they, these seeds are present in the fruit. So these are fruiting plants. So technically by the name, angiosperm should be called fruiting plants, but they are instead called flowering plants because they make flowers. And ovary becomes a fruit. Gymnosperms also produce seeds, but they produce naked seeds. So pro-gymnosperms, then came seed ferns. They were the first seed producing species. One went on to form cycads, which is still present on the planet, but not that, not that abundant. And the other branch went on to make dicots and monocots. So you can also see dicots came early, right? Here. And then monocots came. As you go up, it is recent. As you go down, it is old. So dicots, monocots, and flowering plants, you also see the width of this branch. The flowering plants are the most abundant plants currently on the planet. There are others as well. There are some which were abundant back in time, like during the Jurassic and Triassic period, conifers were more abundant, but now they are less abundant. Do you understand how to read this graph, everyone? Yes, sir. Yeah. So from chlorophyte ancestors came the bryophytes. From tracheophyte ancestors came the lycopods. 
okay so this Ar arborescent lycopods had two branch one went on to become the herbaceous lycopods which are also present today the other one just became extinct can you see a dead end here for plants there are very few dead ends plants are robust but if you go to animal system just in your books you will see uh, quite few dead ends dinosaurs therapsids thicodonts so they have written extinct 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 they are, they are all dead ends for plants for example this during the carboniferous period this particular horse tail synopsids these plants were very abundant now they are not that abundant you know fawns were more or less the same because they have the same environment still ginkgos started expanding after the permian and stay high conifers have converged a little bit same with nettles nettles were also high now they are low but angiosperms Dicots and monocots have just are just expanding. Okay, so this is called branching descent. Everything branches from somewhere. It is not a linear progression. So today, on on the current planet, we also have bryophytes. We also have herbaceous lycopods. We also have horsetails. We also have ferns, ginkgos, conifers, nettles, cycads, angiosperms, and Uh, angiosperms which contains uh, which contains dicots and monocots both so we can't say that angiosperm came from uh, cycads cycads came from conifers conifer came from ferns not like that similarly for animal system also there is branching descent things had common ancestors it's not like humans came from chimpanzees chimpanzees came from lesser chimpanzees they came from tailed monkeys monkeys came from rabbits or something not like that is it clear Yes, sir. We are as evolved as chimpanzees are in time, but we are more complex in terms of our cognitive capabilities. That's why we are different. A mouse is also as evolved as we are, but a mouse is less complex than us compared to the anatomy and physiology. Actually, it's very close to us. You know, we 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 make all our medicines in mouse. You know that almost all. Yeah, all medicines are them, right. yeah all the medicines are tested on mice first mice models so they are very close to us actually <clears throat> not as close as chimpanzees are but yes still close enough so that we can use their genetics their physiology to find cure and cure for diseases of our own so this is how to read plant and now you go back and read that paragraph there they start telling you from chlorophyte x million years ago there were chlorophytes which became this and this and that and that same you do have to do for animals also read the human part from ncert though it's not very justif it's not written in a justified manner in ncert so i will use a different figure from britannica encyclopedia to explain human evolution to you that i do for my classes okay with due credits to britannica encyclopedia okay everyone Sorry, any doubts evolution oh okay so because tomorrow we have to do less let's let let me keep the i'll also use for horse evolution also i'll use britannica encyclopedia's figure to explain the horse evolution okay any other you want human and horse yep human and horse have been together for a very long time you know after dog dogs of course are the first ones there is a very good movie if you are interested it's called um, it's about the evolution how how human first domesticated dogs it's a hollywood movie i'm forgetting the name is it alpha or something is anyone suggesting yeah okay anyways so let, let's end the class here yes cool some please uh, you can leave everyone i'll see you in the next class where we'll Thank finish you, this sir. okay you, please please read and come please